name's Natalie Wexler, and I'm the author of a book called The Knowledge Gap, The Hidden Cause of America's Broken Education System and How to Fix It. And I'm also the co-author of a book called The Writing Revolution. And uh, I'm an education writer. I write for Forbes.com on education, and I've written for a number of other publications. But I'm here today to talk about the knowledge gap. So about 10 years ago now, I got very interested in education and started looking into especially what we call, generally call the achievement gap, the gap in test scores between kids at the top and bottom of the socioeconomic spectrum. This seemed incredibly important as a, a way of bringing more justice and equity to our society to figure out how to narrow that gap. And uh, when I started looking into this, I was told, and what it seemed to me to be the case, was that the real problem was high school. That's where the scores are lowest, the gap between haves and have-nots is the widest and the most stubborn, um, and the kids are often somewhat disengaged, um, and it seems to that that's where everything falls apart, that's where the problem is. But what I stumbled across uh, in writing about this and, and doing some research was that um, there's another part of our education system that I had been told was the bright spot, elementary school, where the scores were slowly rising, the gap was slowly narrowing, it seemed, and the kids seemed much more engaged and you know eager. Um, but what I discovered was that the problems that become so apparent in high school don't begin in high school, and a lot of them really have their roots in how we teach elementary school. So what do I mean by that? Well, basically what I'm talking about is how we approach reading. Just to lay out the landscape here, um, there are two basic components of reading. There's decoding, sounding out words, which um, should be taught as a set of skills, foundational skills like phonemic awareness, hearing the sounds in words and phonics, connecting those sounds to letters, fluency, being able to read at a, an appropriate pace with appropriate expression. And we do have quite a few problems in many schools in this country with how decoding is taught. Um, it's often not taught explicitly as a set of these skills. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about those problems. I'm going to focus on the other aspect of reading comprehension. Obviously, you need both. You need to be able to sound out words and you need to be able to understand what you're reading to become a good reader. And I would argue that the problems with the way we teach comprehension are uh, probably more widespread and better hidden than the problems with the way we teach decoding. So how do we generally go about teaching reading comprehension? Well, the standard approach is to teach reading comprehension as a set of skills and strategies. I won't go into the distinction between skills and strategies. I think a lot of educators use them interchangeably, but they're things like identifying the main idea in details, determining the author's purpose, making inferences, asking questions. And often there will be a skill of the week that a teacher will demonstrate, model for, for the class. Um, and the other part of this approach is that students will have been tested to determine their individual reading levels. Um, and those could be years below their, their grade levels. What they're directed to do is to practice the skill of the week or the strategy of the week on books that are at their levels. In other words, easy enough for them to read independently. And um, the idea is that if they practice those skills diligently, if they become good at finding the main idea, they will move up this ladder of text complexity. If they're reading below grade level, they're ca they'll catch up to where they need to be. And also that they'll be able to apply those skills to, say, find the main idea of any text that's put in front of them, whether it's a passage on a reading comprehension test at the end of the year or a textbook in high school. Let's test out that theory. I'm just going to show you a paragraph from a newspaper, and I'm going to ask you to find the main idea, and I'm sure you're expert readers, so it shouldn't be a, a, a big a heavy lift. Let's take a look at it. 
you may understand the individual words in this passage, but they may not be adding up. It may be pretty difficult to find the main idea here. I mean, you may know what adjudged means and what leg means and what before means, but what does it mean to be adjudged leg before? Um, so this is a phenomenon that uh, cognitive scientists have known about for quite a while now. And basically, um, the idea here is that if you don't have background knowledge about what you're reading about, it can be very difficult to find the main idea. I forgot to mention that this paragraph was taken from a British newspaper. And if you're a cricket fan, you'll have no trouble understanding what it's describing, which is a, a cricket match. But if you don't know much about cricket, this is pretty impenetrable. And I don't know much about cricket. I'm not sure what this is trying to tell me. So as I mentioned, cognitive scientists have known about this for a while. Um, back in the late 1980s, uh, there, there was a landmark study that was done. And the researchers really wanted to know what is more important in reading comprehension. Is it general reading of comprehension ability? Or is it really more knowledge of the topic? And they chose the topic of baseball because they figured there are a lot of kids out there who know a lot about baseball, but they aren't generally good readers. They took a bunch of seventh and eighth graders and they divided them up into four groups uh, according to how well they scored on a standardized reading comprehension test and how much they knew about baseball. And then they gave them a passage describing a baseball game and tested their comprehension. And what they found was that the kids who knew about baseball, who were kind of baseball experts, they, they all did quite well on this comprehension test when the topic was baseball. And the other kids who didn't know about baseball did not do well, regardless of how well they'd scored on that standardized reading test. So for example, if you look at those middle two bars, the one on the left, those are the kids who were supposedly poor readers but knew a lot about baseball. And to their right, that blue bar is the kids who were supposedly good readers but didn't know about baseball. And as you can see, the kids who were supposedly poor readers did a lot better when the topic was baseball. This is a, a study that's been replicated many times now, and um, it's, pretty, it's pretty well accepted. What's really important in reading comprehension, not the only factor, but the prime factor is how much you know about the topic. And this may seem kind of obvious when it's something that calls for somewhat specialized knowledge like baseball or cricket or, you know, molecular biology. If, if you don't know much about that and try to read the abstract of a scholarly article on that topic, it's going to be tough going. I think what is less obvious to many of us is how much background knowledge we all draw on as educated adults to make sense of almost anything we read, um, newspaper, magazine articles. And so I'm going to show you a paragraph taken from another newspaper story, um, not about cricket. But this time, I'd like you to read through it and think about how much background knowledge you're drawing on to understand what you're reading. I'm assuming that you are able to follow this, but what I notice when I read through this is that it assumes that the reader is going to know things like what an appeal is, um, what the Supreme Court is, what a federal appeals court is, what a grand jury is, what a subpoena is, what a district attorney is. So a lot of knowledge about the legal system is, it's not explained here, it's just assumed. And this isn't written for people who've been to law school. Um, this is written for general readers. And if you do know what all those things are, then you have no trouble understanding this paragraph. But if you don't know a lot of those words, then it's going to be tough going, just like that cricket paragraph was. What does this have to do with testing? Well, the passages on, on uh, standardized reading comprehension tests, like any written passages, leave a lot of information out. They assume that the reader knows certain information. Authors do that because to explain every term that they use would make the writing very tedious. Um, but, you know, reading comprehension tests are not tied to specific topics that kids have learned in school. In fact, they're designed not to be tied to those topics because the idea is we want to test comprehension skills. You know, so the topics are kind of random. And if you have the knowledge 
to understand the passage, then you can demonstrate your skills. But if you don't have that knowledge, if the passage is impenetrable to you, then you don't get an opportunity to demonstrate your skills. So let's take a look at a released item from a third grade uh, reading comprehension test. And, and let's see how much knowledge is assumed there. For us as educated adults, this passage may look pretty straightforward. But now let's take a look at this same passage with words and phrases blacked out that a lot of third graders probably won't know. And when you're missing that much information, uh, then it really becomes as impenetrable as that cricket paragraph. Uh, it's it's very going to be very hard to answer questions about this paragraph because you're missing so much information. Now, of course, some third graders will know these words or many of these words and concepts. Uh, and those tend to be the third graders who've been able to pick up that information outside of school, the ones with more highly educated parents, who in our society tend to be the parents with more income. But the other kids are reliant on school for that kind of information, for that kind of vocabulary. And they, um, unfortunately, in our current system, are often the least likely to get that kind of information from school. Because in the last 20 years or so, as reading and math tests have become so important, the curriculum, which was always dominated in the elementary years by reading and math, has become even more dominated by those tested subjects. And so social studies and the arts and to some extent science, have really been eliminated or at least marginalized from the curriculum in the elementary grades and, and often even in middle school. And that's especially true in schools where test scores are low because you want to spend more time equipping kids for those tests. But the irony or the, the tragedy really is that those subjects that have been eliminated, social studies, the arts, science, those are the subjects that really could convey the knowledge and vocabulary that would boost students' reading comprehension and ultimately their test scores. So in an effort to boost test scores, we've really kind of been shooting ourselves in the foot here and undermining our own efforts. So that explains, to a large extent, this gap in test scores uh, between haves and have-nots. What about high school? What does all this have to do with high school? Well. Having knowledge doesn't just help you understand what you're reading about, it also helps you absorb and retain new information. So if you already know about baseball and you read an article about baseball, you're more likely not only to understand it, but to remember the new stuff that was in there about baseball. So it's been said that knowledge is like Velcro. It sticks best to other related knowledge. So what this means is that the kids who start out with more knowledge and vocabulary, probably because they've been able to pick it up outside school, especially in our leveled reading system, they're able to read more sophisticated books with um, more sophisticated vocabulary, and they're also able to retain more new knowledge and vocabulary from those books. And that, in turn, equips them to read yet more complex books. And so it's a kind of virtuous snowballing cycle. But the other kids in our system are limited to simpler texts with simpler vocabulary. And even with those texts, they're less likely to have that other half of the Velcro that will enable them to absorb and retain new information. And so what happens is they fall farther and farther behind every year as compared to their more advantaged peers. This has been called the Matthew effect in reading. Um, and that's a reference to the gospel of St. Matthew and especially to the part of it that it translates to the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. What it means is that as time goes on, that gap between good readers and poor readers gets wider and harder to narrow. And that's why it's so important to begin in the elementary years building knowledge for all kids, and especially for kids who were not as likely to pick up academic kinds of knowledge and vocabulary outside school. If, if you wait until high school, it's going to be very hard to do much about that gap. And what happens, as I mentioned, um, kids can get to, through middle school without really having had systematic exposure to 
history, geography, science, anything but reading and math. And so that leads to another kind of gap, and that's the difference between what we assume high school students know and what many do know. I've talked to a lot of teachers, especially in high poverty high schools, and I've, I've volunteered in some. And uh, while well, teachers have told me they've had students at all levels of ability, they've also told me it's not uncommon to get students in high school who don't yet know the difference between a city and a state or a country and a continent, who can't find the United States on a map of the world, um, who don't can't find their hometown on the map of the United States, and who also don't have a sense of historical chronology. Um, they, they have trouble, you know, they may think that Martin Luther King and Frederick Douglass were friends. And it's not because they can't learn these things. It's because no one has taught them these things. And it's very hard to make up for all that lost time in high school. And if, you're, if you get to high school and you're expected to read a textbook on world history, but you don't have that sense of historical chronology, you don't know what Europe is, you know, you're, you're unsure about so many things that a book like this will assume you know, this is gonna be very frustrating for you as a student and also for your teacher. When I stumbled upon this problem and I, I realized, even though I thought I knew a lot about education, I'd been writing about it as a journalist for a while and I'd never heard anyone talk about this problem um, that was going on in elementary school that really was underlying so many of the other problems our schools are trying to address. And I realized that uh, it, somebody needed to maybe write a book about this that would get it into the public conversation. And that is what I tried to do um, in The Knowledge Gap. But I didn't want just to describe this problem. I also wanted to talk about what can we do about it? And the good news is that there is a lot that schools can do uh, to, to narrow this gap rather than to allow it to get wider every year, which is what is happening in our schools right now. What can schools do? Well, the first step is to adopt a different kind of elementary literacy curriculum. It used to be that the only kind of elementary literacy curricula that you could get was one that was focused on comprehension skills skill of the week. In the last six years or so, uh, there have been several new literacy curricula for the elementary grades that have been developed. These are a few of them. There are probably some more out there now. Uh, but these are the ones that I'm somewhat familiar with. They're all different. They cover different bodies of knowledge in different ways. But they have two important defining characteristics that they share. One is that they are organized by topic, topics in history, science, the arts, literature, rather than by skills. And they spend at least a couple of weeks on a particular topic. So not clouds one day and zebras the next, because really what we're learning is how to find the main idea. But we're going to think, talk about, read about, hear about this particular topic for a couple of weeks now. And that gives students the opportunity to absorb and retain new information and the vocabulary that goes with it. The other characteristic that they all have is that they have teachers reading aloud to students, to the entire class, from texts that are too difficult for those students, especially at the elementary level, to read themselves. And that's really important for a couple of reasons. One is that written language is almost always more complex than spoken language. It has its own syntax and vocabulary. And if students are going to understand written language when they are reading it themselves independently, they need to have had an opportunity to hear that language, to get used to it. The other related thing is that students' listening comprehension exceeds their reading comprehension, not just in the elementary grades, but on average through middle school. And that means that they can absorb more complex concepts and vocabulary through listening and discussion is also important than through their own reading. And that's really important to build their knowledge so that when it comes time for them to read about ancient China or whatever, that they will be familiar with the concepts and vocabulary. It will make it a lot easier for them to read independently. One of the things I did for the book was to follow a couple of elementary classrooms, early elementary classrooms, um, to make this more concrete for myself and for the reader. What does this really look like? And so I followed one classroom that was a 
doing the usual skills focused approach to reading comprehension using a basal reader and the other that was using one of these new content focused elementary literacy curricula that was building kids knowledge. I wish I could show you videos of these two classrooms. I can't do that, but I do have posters that will give you an idea of the differences between these two classrooms. And I should mention that although the classrooms were not identical, one was first grade, one was second grade, no two classrooms are going to be identical. They were pretty similar in many ways. All of the students were from low income families in both classrooms. They were all children of color. And the teachers in both classrooms were hardworking, dedicated, smart teachers. But the classrooms were like night and day. And the real difference, the reason they were so different, was the curriculum, what was being taught. In the skills focused classroom, there were many, there were some posters on the walls, but they were all about skills. The discussions, such as they were, were supposed to be all about skills. But it was very hard to get a discussion going because these first graders were really not that interested in talking about main idea or the difference between a caption and a subtitle, which was the focus of one lesson. They just didn't care. It was really kind of abstract. And uh, you know, it was, the teacher would kind of struggle to get a discussion going. In the content-focused classroom, on the other hand, um, there were lots of really interesting discussions about the content that they were learning about. And there were lots of posters all over the room, uh, like this one, um, focusing on content, focusing on things like this is from the unit they did on Greek myths, which the kids loved. This I chose more or less at random happens to be about the myth of Daedalus and Icarus. And these posters would be created collaboratively uh, by the teacher and the students during and after the day's read aloud. So this was done uh, during and after the read aloud of the, the myth of Daedalus and Icarus. Uh, and there are a couple of things I'd like to point out about this poster. Uh, one is the vocabulary. You can see at the top, the vocabulary words were desperately plummeted, foresight. Um, those were the words that were being focused on. Now, those are pretty sophisticated words for any second graders, but most of the kids in this class were actually from non-English speaking families, and some of them were still learning English themselves. And yet they were using words like this in their conversation. I had lunch with some of them about three quarters of the way through the school year, and they were using words like revenge and opponent and labyrinth. They were retaining those words because they were getting them in an engaging context and they were using them in class discussion. And those words will stand them in very good stead in high school and beyond. The other thing I'd like to point out here is that there are things here that might look like the teacher is focusing on skills. There's a question of asking students to predict what is Daedalus's plan. There are things that say cause and effect, but the teacher was not trying to teach the skill of making predictions or the skill of determining cause and effect. She was bringing those things in as a way of getting kids to really think about the content. And so it's not like you can never ask kids to find the main idea. It's a question of what you put in the foreground. And if you put content in the foreground, then kids will develop those skills pretty naturally uh, if you ask them those kinds of questions. So I don't want to leave you with the impression that if you don't start building kids' knowledge in elementary school, that all is lost. High school is not too late to build knowledge. It's just more difficult because the gaps, as I mentioned, are so much larger and the expectations uh, of what students already know are so much higher. But there are things you can do to compensate for those gaps. And from what I've seen, the most promising thing is to teach kids to write about what they're learning. Writing is potentially such a powerful lever for building knowledge that it can compensate for that missing Velcro that students may not have. Let's take a minute to talk about why is that? Why do I say that writing is such a powerful way to build knowledge? Well, scientists haven't really studied writing that much, but they have studied a couple of other things that enter into the writing process. One of those is what's known as retrieval practice, or sometimes called the testing effect. It's been studied mostly in the context of quizzes or testing. But what it boils down to is that if you try to recall information that you've slightly forgotten, that's a very powerful boost to retaining that information. It gets lodged in your long-term memory. The second thing that 
psychologists, cognitive scientists have found is something called the protege effect. And what that boils down to is that when you explain something to another person in your own words, that boosts both your own comprehension, because you can't explain it unless you figure out what it means, and your retention of information. And both of these effects enter into writing. That's what we do when we write, unless we're just copying something that's in front of us. We're both recalling information we've slightly forgotten, and we're putting it into our own words. We're explaining it to somebody. We don't know who, the, the unknown reader, but another person. So that's why writing can be so powerful. But there is a caveat here, and that is that writing is one of the most, maybe the most difficult thing we ask kids to do in school. It's much more difficult than reading, which we know is pretty tough. And the reason it's so difficult has to do with what psychologists call working memory. Working memory is basically like short-term memory or consciousness. And the important thing to remember or to know about working memory is that it can only hold a limited number of things for a limited period of time. And when you're an inexperienced writer, you're juggling all sorts of things. Uh, you may be juggling, if you're young, letter formation. You're juggling spelling. How do I spell that word? What word to choose? how to organize your thoughts, all sorts of things, plus whatever content it is you're trying to write about. If we just ask students to write at length, that, that imposes a huge demand on their working memory, and they don't have the cognitive capacity available to either learn how to write well or to derive those knowledge-building benefits from writing because they don't have the capacity to really think about what they're writing about. So what can we do about this? Two things, uh, in order to build the kind of knowledge we want kids to get, we need to ground all the writing activity they're doing or as much of it as possible in the content that we want them to learn, the content of the curriculum. But secondly, we have to make it not an overwhelming task. We have to make it manageable by modulating that load that writing imposes on working memory. And the best way to do that is to have students start writing at the sentence level rather than asking them to write at length. So there's a method that I'm familiar with that combines both of those things. It's the only method I know of that combines both of those things, and it's called The Writing Revolution. It's the title of a book I've co-authored with a veteran educator named Judith Hockman, who devised, developed this method over a period of many years. It does start at the sentence. It doesn't end at the sentence level. It goes all the way through argumentative essays, but it does start there. And no matter what the grade level is, if students have not yet learned to write a good sentence, that's where instruction needs to begin. Because if you can't write a good sentence, you're never going to write a good paragraph. You're never going to write a good essay. And also, if you want kids to gain knowledge, through their writing. Even high school students can be very inexperienced writers, and so they, they need to learn how to write sentences first. It doesn't mean you know, that it's going to be a, a, a babyish activity. I think there is a, an assumption out there that writing sentences is just for kids in elementary school, but writing a sentence can be a very difficult exercise. It all depends on the content that you're dealing with. One of the activities in the writing revolution method is called because, but, and so. And by the way, this is a method that can be adapted to any subject matter as well as any grade level. It's not just for English class or the ELA block. So let's say you're a social studies teacher or a history teacher and you're teaching about the presidency of Andrew Jackson. You could give your students sentence stems to finish that use these three conjunctions. So Andrew Jackson was a popular president because but, and so. Now, each of these sentences requires students to think about information they may have slightly forgotten about the presidency of Andrew Jackson in a different way and put it into their own words. And but is going to be a little more difficult than because, because it, it asks for a contrasting piece of information. This also gives students practice in using these conjunctions, which not all students really just know how to do. And there are different ways that students could finish these, but here's some, here are some examples. Because he was the champion of the common man, but there were many critics of his kitchen cabinet and spoil system, so 
he easily won re-election in 1832. So that, I hope, gives you an idea of the connections between writing and building knowledge and how sentences can help with that. But in order to use this approach to build knowledge, you actually need content in the curriculum. And in many elementary school classrooms, as we know, there just isn't much content. There may not be enough content to enable students to write coherent sentences about anything but their own experience. So the first thing to do is to adopt, if you do not already have a content-rich elementary curriculum, to adopt one. And, and those sentence-level activities can be used very effectively at the elementary level. It's not going to be enough because, especially for elementary teachers, this approach, this new kind of curriculum is going to be really unfamiliar and they may need some support and some help in implementing it well and understanding what it's all about. But it is the first step and it's a necessary first step. And you know, curriculum itself, it can be hugely powerful we hear a lot about the importance of having high expectations for all students, and that really is important. But I've met a lot of teachers who do have high expectations. What they haven't had are the materials that will enable their students to meet those high expectations. But with the right materials, students can not only meet high expectations, but even exceed them. And I, I will just end with an anecdote um, that I heard when I was researching the knowledge gap that brought that home to me. It had to do with a second grade teacher whose school had recently adopted one of these new knowledge building curricula. And she was a little skeptical, but she was giving one of her second graders a test to determine his individual reading level. And he was really a struggling reader. He, he was at the very low end of second grade, and this was well into the school year. And she saw in the testing kit that she had been given that there was a text on the topic of westward expansion. It just so happened that that was the topic that the class had spent two weeks on as part of this new curriculum. But the text on westward expansion was at a fourth grade reading level, and this was a struggling second grader. But just out of curiosity, the teacher handed the boy the text, and he read it with 98% accuracy and 100% comprehension. And so the teacher thought, well, maybe there is something to this new curriculum. But also, as I said, I think what another thing that happened was the teacher saw that little boy differently and what he was capable of. And I think that little boy saw himself differently, too. And one of the reasons that I feel so much urgency about this topic is that there are untold numbers of kids out there who've been told, just practice your comprehension skills and strategies and you will become a better reader and a better student. And there is really no evidence that that works. But for a kid who's been told that it doesn't work, that child may feel that he's got no one to blame but himself and that he's in, quote unquote, the dumb reading group. And there's really no reason for that. We need to prevent that from happening to so many kids. We need to, there's untold potential out there that is going to waste. We need to start unlocking that potential for teachers and for students as soon as we can. So thanks very much uh, for listening.